have not planned any fire alarms today, but in case of an emergency, we'll have, we will be following university guidelines. Um, to those who are new to the building, the toilets are up the hall to your left. Um, please keep your phones on silence and they don't take any photos with the flash on. We'll have photographs after the event in like two weeks uh, available online. And yes, that will be all for me. Thank you for coming again. And let me introduce you to Violet McLean. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to everyone here in the room this evening and those who are watching us on Zoom. We're absolutely delighted to welcome you back, or should I say, welcome you home to AUB. Um, our last event in real time, or as Will would say in 3D, was the 16th of January 2020 with our Brian Clark in conversation event. Um, tonight not only formally opens our Crossing the Line exhibition, it also launches the 23rd Gallery Exhibition Programme. Tonight's In Conversation event is our first event of our Crossing the Line event series. Please refer to your marketing flyer that you received on your way in uh, for the list of events in our series and more information on booking information can be found on the website. And also this flyer is very important because it's got your drinks voucher safety mm -hmm. drink. So if you want a drink, <laughs> make sure you keep that. Um, the last 18 months has been understandably been very challenging for us all. It saw the gallery turn our social media platforms into our new gallery walls. We moved our operations, events, and a number of our exhibitions online in a matter of weeks. No pandemic was going to stop us. If anything, it was going to make us stronger as a university and community. I do believe that art does make the world go around in a much better place. <clears throat> um, what we do here at AUB is only a testament to that. Just wait for someone to think of this. We would also like to thank our academic partners for working on this exhibition and events program with us. We worked in partnership with BA Illustration, uh, BA Honours Architecture, BA Film Production, and BA Honours Model Making. So a very thank you to Tom, but I'll be mentioning Tom later. But a special thanks to BA Creative Events Management staff and students who are working with us in all our events. Not that I'm biased to that course as being an alumni, but a great thank you very much from me to Creative Events Management. We'd also like to thank our commission artists, NERCS, who has commissioned the paint the wall, the graffiti wall in the lower gallery for our fashion installation. Tom Hooper, BA model making student for our spray tan sculpture, which is also in the fashion installation. Bridie Cheeseman for Earth Day, which is a mural that can be found outside the Starbucks door on the film stairways. So thank you to Bridie. The private collectors for the loans of works, Joshua Reed, Professor Paul Goff, Simon Pride, David Stock and Mel Dip. I'd also like to thank the gallery team, Will, Elise, uh, Eloise, Katie, Joe, our student volunteers, Emily, Fadika and Naz. And also thank you to Eden, Alex, Ben, and Alex for helping us today to, for the final bits in the exhibition. I would also like to formally congratulate and thank our curators, Joshua Reed, Professor Paul Goff. Um, your knowledge, insight, passion for the, for the subject has been infectious. You've worked extremely hard to bring this amazing exhibition to us. It has been a pleasure to work with you both. Your commitment, and drive in curating this show has been inspiring and greatly respected and admired by us as a team. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you for curating our amazing comeback exhibition. Tonight is uh, hosted and chaired by Professor Dominic Shepherd, Associate Professor Dominic Shepherd. Yeah. Let me one day, one day, <laughs> one day. One day. <laughs> You're always Professor Dominic. So let me tell you a little bit about Dominic. He's a practicing artist, associate professor at the university. He's taught on BA Fine Art and he teaches painting on the MA uh, Fine Art. He's exhibit internationally. He with an extensive record of group shows, solo exhibitions in London, New York, Berlin, Los Angeles, Helsinki, Munich, and Miami. And is presented, represented by the Charlie Smith Gallery, London. Mm -hmm. Dominic has won several prizes, 
He has included and has written for various publications as well as delivering papers and lectures on his practice. Um, Dominic's uh, research is in both academic and practice based. Dominic has collaborated with the gallery on several projects. In 2010, his paintings were showcased in, Myc in Mycelium alongside Gavin Parkinson as part of the Textbus work series. He also curated the Black Mirror Magic and Art exhibition and publication in 2017, and he also had a starring role in our Palameombe documentary. Um. So it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Professor, Associate Professor Dominic Shepherd to take the event. Professor. Great. great. Thank you very much, Violet. <laughs> And thank you very much for everyone who's um, here in person, and also for everybody who's joining us um, online through um, through you know the digital channels. So um, I would like to first of all, I'd just like to say um, that Joshua Reed, who's curated the show, and, and much of the work is out there, unfortunately can't be with us um, tonight. So we're very fortunate that we got Vincent Larkin to kind of start, step in, um, so we can still join in with this kind of conversation about the work. I'm going to introduce. Um, uh, the two uh, panelists, I suppose, we should yep. describe ourselves so. tonight. Um, you. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, there's um, uh, Professor Paul Goff. Um, Professor Paul Goff is the Vice Chancellor here at Arts um, University Bournemouth. Paul is also a painter, yeah, broadcaster, and author, and he has exhibited internationally and is represented in the permanent collection of the Imperial War Museum in London, the Canadian War Museum. Ottawa and the National War Memorial in New Zealand, along with leading roles in international higher education and global research assessment, his research into the representation of war and peace has been presented to audiences throughout the world. He has published nine books, including monographs on the British painter Stanley Spencer, oh, one of my faves, Paul and um, John Nash, and several comprehensive studies of art from both world wars. Over the past decade, he has curated many exhibitions, including Shock and Awe, Contemporary Art at War and Peace, and Brothers in Arms, an exhibition of John and Paul Nash. He worked in television for 10 years, appears regularly on the UK and global media, and is currently writing his second book about the street artist, Banksy, which is very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Vincent Larkin. Um, Vincent Larkin is an illustrator and an artist who works in print and drawing. His practice is based around the idea of the uncomfortable narrative, the overlaps and diversions in the way we tell the stories of ourselves. In the pursuit of this idea, he uses book form, printed media, web-based media, and sometimes song, maybe later. Yeah. I have retired from song. <laughs> <laughs> His work has been featured as part of the Take Britain's Source Spotlight Display for the Pattern Graphics Print Month and exhibited at the book, book, the book Art Bookshop in London. In 2015, Vincent completed a residency with the Victorian Albert Museum. Vincent teaches across the BA illustration course with a focus on integrating theory and practice. He places emphasis on the identification of illustrative strategies from outside industry in order to inform new thinking in regards to illustration. That's what you do. I do that, but I didn't know that was in there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Great. Right. Um, I think it's a great show. I had a pretty good look around it now. now. I've seen it before. Now in its finished state, you know, really enjoyed um, you know, looking at the, you know, the scale. And it brought me back to living in Brighton in the early 90s. Um, when I kind of started to see mm. this emergence of, you know, mm. some of the things that I actually recognise some of mm. the kind of, um, I suppose, the tropes and, and, and the kind of the ways and the kind of manners of which things are being produced. Um, and I was just thinking, in a way, about those kind of precedents or what came before the kind of 1990s and what we're seeing mm. in that kind of street art, which now has kind of quite a voice. You know, mm. Here it is, you know, in, 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 in the gallery in the AUB. Um, you know, and I'm kind of looking back and I think of kind of Dada, or I think of Situationist, I might bring them back into this. You know, I think of punk and things. But I think, you know, I'm wondering if you could help, you know, elucidate further on, on, on where, 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 where things, where it came from and where you think it may come, come from. Paul, if I'm more, mm. Vincent, do anybody want to? Where did it come from? It's interesting, yeah. if you talk to uh, art historians, there is a kind of crisis really about what that is we're looking at there. Mm. It, it's, I mean, there's been a transition the last 30 years, I guess, between graffiti, which was stuck down the alleys, stuck down the, 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 the stuck down the kind of the, 
the, the sides of the urban realm and not really meant for an audience other than the kind of cognoscenti, the people who could read it, could understand it and could decipher it. So it's willfully uh, illegal, willfully in a corner and undecipherable. So the public were not invited. You saw a transition uh, with your classic uh, work in, in New York in particular, with that sort of uh, high wild style exhibition work that you'd see on the walls in, in, and on, the, on the, um, the underground in, in New York City. Over a period of time, that's morphed into something that's known as street art. So the very word art attached to it means that someone somewhere along the line has thought of commodifying this, of starting to put it into a context that isn't just the wall and gives it longevity. Because so much of that work, the graffiti work we see and still see is, is short-lived, deliberately short-lived. And it fights for its space on, on a busy urban street. Moving from graffiti to street art into this new realm, which I guess is what we're looking at here, Dom, yeah. is around urban art. It okay. belongs in the urban realm, but actually what the exhibition tried to do when Josh and I were thinking about curating this show and drawing upon his terrific collection is crossing the line is the theme of the show because where does it sit in an environment that is um, contested on the street or is it contested on the gallery wall? And I think there's a, that's what the show really tries to talk about through a, through a set of questions that we put to each other very early on. So its origins very much are in the kind of graffiti world, but you can see how uh, there's been a shift. And some say that it's lost its credibility, lost its street cred, and it's moved into a world of credit in your bank. And I think that's a really kind of ah, interesting well, moment correct. where it moves from one to the other. Yeah. Okay. Vincent, have you got thoughts about where and, I, and one of those thoughts of you know with that, that's in a way they're gonna that's like the graffiti side of things mm. that side but is there because there's that word art as well mm. yeah you know i wonder if that's there so from a from a less specific but more general perspective mm. from the mm. point of view of, as, as uh, an academic and a practitioner of illustration mm. i'm interested in art in the in the public realm mm. which uh, which d does not necessarily only include uh, commercial art I mean, it's it art. It's art in the public realm. Is, it can also be a uh, work that is is not seeking a commercial audience. Mm. So w within that umbrella, that, that that's where um, graffiti or any sort of acts of iconoclasm, like anything that, that is mark making, in order to uh, in order to uh, a cultural thing, in order to uh, join in on a, on, a, on on something, a communication, and that is my more broader interest in the subject, mm. the specific. Of, of what you're talking about there that you know it's very interesting for me from to hear that perspective but generally i come to it thinking about the the sort of the um crossing the line between the public and the uh the public and the commercial spheres mm, like what's yeah. what is owned by everybody and what is mm. is there to be monetized mm. and that's very interesting to me mm, yeah. yeah yeah i mean uh, on that point i'm kind of coming back i remember um I was, when I left Brighton, I, I moved to um, to Brixton. I lived in an electric mansion, electric avenue, and I was peering out of my window one day, and I noticed somebody with a stepladder, and he was walking across, and there was these arches, these kind of railway arches there, and he put them up, and he was it was in the evening, and he was kind of going up and down, and I was, and I and I went out and get bread or whatever I did, and I went up, and he had these um, little tiles, and he was just going up and down. This was around the mid nineties, and he was putting these little kind of tiles together, making this little space invader image on the wall. I said, oh, what are you up to, you know? And, uh, and he kind of talked to me and he said, oh, I go around London and I put these little space invader things up there. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, gosh, you know. Um, you know, and of course, I was in my high art world. I kind of thought, gosh, well, you know, that's something else. And now here, I've seen it in the gallery, you know, it's like, oh, it's the space invader. Mm -hmm. And um, and I brought this up with Vincent um, earlier when we were chatting. And yeah. Vincent said, ah, but was he the authentic space mm -hmm. invader? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm just wondering about that no issues of um, authenticity mm. um, that then come through something which is incognito. And also, I think, you know, questions which become very interesting with what you were saying earlier, and I suppose this is in the terms of, you know, we have a collection out there of kind of copyright mm. and ownership. Um, when you make something in a public space, who owns it? And mm. if you say, well, I'm incognito, you, you know, who, you know who, who, who has that? That authorship's on, on it. Also, if you take a photograph of it, because I looked online and I saw there was mugs and T-shirts and even a jigsaw puzzle I found of some street art, which mm. I thought, well, you know, I'll get the jigsaw puzzle. Um, you know, so, so where does, I don't know, where does that line? I think that's quite of interest to, to, to students and all of us about that, about that kind of copyright or authorship. So it's a, it's a really massive 
set of questions there, Dominic. Yeah. Um, There's a chapter in the book I'm writing at the moment called Monetizing Mockery. It goes back to what you just said there, Vincent, about how do you make money out of so-called street art? And, uh, you know, the, the, the best of street artists would say, you know, I've got to earn a crust. I've got to kind of make a living out of this. So what I think you see is a great many of those artists, again, goes back to cred credentials, credibility on the street, mm. being able to get in the language that's used by many street artists. It's, it's a very um, it's a very gendered environment, quite phallocentric in many ways of getting it up. They mm. want to get their graffiti up as high as possible in the most obscure place as possible. It's a kind of it's, it's very much about verticality and, and saying this is bigger, bolder, brighter than mm. than anyone else's. So to put your work out in the public domain is an act of, of sort of defiance. It's against the law. Uh, but if you take most of the stencilers that we know best, is that they also recognise that hey, they had to earn a crust. Uh, and that some of the stencil work that was done, mm. it worked in several ways. And I think what's interesting is that a stencil transfer is very easy to a screen print. A screen print transfer is very easy to kind of a handmade paper and put in a frame. And at the end of the 1990s, and at the start of the 2000s, Museums, and the v and is a good example of this, Victoria Albert Museum in London, started thinking, these are collectibles here. These right. are being issued in multiples. Mm. And there's a great story about um, Steve Lazaridis, who was working with a lot of street artists at the time, started flogging, selling a lot of these prints made from stencils that were in the public domain. They're already getting notoriety, but wouldn't last forever. Then selling multiple screen prints often hand-signed, often hand-coloured, from the back of his Ford Escort in a pub car park. Okay. So it started very much like some sort of brick lane, mm -hmm. side of the road, you know, uh, junk shop or, or um, a jungle sale kind of approach. But as the galleries became interested in the likes of the V&A, very, very quietly in 2004, rather impressive kind of um, uh, a print curator there started seeing that there was potentially uh, something happening here, just like 30 years previously, the pop art movement had kind of started introducing a whole range of really high quality artwork, then uh, collecting became the norm. And what entered into a world was around irreverence, around defacing, around um, cock and snoot, the law started to have a structure to it. Right. So there's some great stories that some of the front of house, like pictures on walls, some of the galleries you mentioned in Brighton, started to uh, organize themselves in a way that you realize behind what is seen as irreverent street art actually has an immense commercial organization behind it because because artists take themselves seriously just like illustrators they they have agents they have people who organize them and that they have to keep a rigor to their own artwork otherwise it's kind of mayhem what happens then of course is you get those who are the taggers the graffiti artists who yeah. want to stay in that world of of it, uh, immunity, anonymity, don't want to play that other game. Right. So you have some real schisms across okay. the whole sector. I, I mean, is that? It's well, I imagine there are. Yeah. You don't think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so when uh, the interaction of graffiti artists <clears throat> in illustration, mm. you bring, you're bringing a culture which is about um, transgressing copyright into right. a place where copyright is the thing that secures mm. the monetization of, of what you're doing. Mm. And well, I can, there's a Shepherd Ferry example. Okay. Um, please. Um, well, which is that uh, Shepard Ferry, uh, the Hope poster for um, Obama. So that, that poster was uh, something that he, he took it upon himself in order to promote the Obama campaign. He made this poster in order to raise money for the Obama campaign. Uh, and then uh, this poster was tremendously successful and, and republished everywhere. It turned out it was based upon a photograph and it wasn't, it wasn't really taken that further away from a photograph from uh, a talk that Obama did um, pre- um, uh, pre-election campaign and uh, he uh, because of the way that so he's transgressing the copyright trans like like a graffiti artist would transgress okay. uh, private space in order to do graffiti but when he does it within a commercial marketplace he ended up getting uh, sued and given a two-year suspended sentence and he had to pay mm -hmm. twenty thousand uh, dollars in mm -hmm. damages so he was he could you know his suspended sentence prison is mentioned in america they take very copyright very seriously mm -hmm. so it's a very sort of strange relationship and uh yeah, and that's just that's an, an interesting example of how this world interacts with illustration. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and I, I think there we're talking about copyright, and I'm thinking about you know we, we're seeing the collection out there. We're seeing you know Joshua Reed's collection, you know, and and there's some of your work, Paul, and, and other people's as well. And I'm just thinking about you know the, you know we're, we're and changing over from the kind of the artist to the collector, mm. and thinking about you know what being a collector. I mean, there might be a question about what, what being a collector is from an admirer mm. to mm. when you happen that you know mm. I collect certain things. Vinyl and uh, ceramics, things like that, get obsessed by. But the idea of like 
the, one the collector and i suppose from that is this you know the artist needs the collector mm. but also how much do the collectors need not just the art but mm. also the artists mm. that sense of a movement i'm thinking also of somebody like you know peggy guggenheim with the kind of surrealist and then the abstract expressionist charles sarchi with the ybas mm. you know, where where does the collector come in with 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 this idea and and then what you know and how mm. and, and that and the importance of the collector to mm. making something you mentioned the VNA mm. but also individuals and things I'm just mm. the um what's interesting about the show here and and Josh where he would tell you I've asked him many times and in the in the publication we are doing on the back of this exhibition which should be done when I finish writing parts of it uh and and Josh I interviewed Josh and talked to him and a lot of it was ephemera a lot of okay. it was the detritus of mm. major exhibitions mm. so when josh went to uh, dismaland uh mm. the big banks he showed western superman in 2015 yes he looked at the work he took mm. photographs of the people looking at the work but he was scouring the floor a lot of the time and finding stuff there, there's a the shrigley um balloon okay there, yes the, which is you know, up on the, uh, we yep. went there and you were given a balloon saying i'm an imbecile mm. you got to carry around look happy or unhappy while you're carrying it um yeah. and lots of odds and ends that were lying around so what you also see in there it's not so much the formal collector, it's actually about the bits and pieces. So the poster's made up of someone scribbling on a, a, a stamp, just actually an legal act to deface mm. both a pound or a, a five pound note and then the, mm. the stamp. So the collection's made up of stuff that both has uh, commercial value in the proper sense of a limited edition mm. that has been shown in galleries, or bought from a gallery, etc., and then accrues value in the way that art does at the moment extraordinarily but it also is made up of bits and bobs that he's found lying around but it's but but to, to, to take those bits and bobs is that mm. because it's an act of transgression because as i said when you go to this land mm. it means you went oh <laughs> so uh, a, or, or, and i don't mean anything wrong sure. you know but, but but also is it is it i mean to actually act yeah. in that way or is it also the sense that you by accruing those things they have that yeah, they have the, the touch, yeah, they have sure. the ephemera, they have the kind the of authenticity. the authenticity yeah. more so maybe sure. than the thing in the frame because they are the the yeah. objects which have that kind of, uh, the, I'll say the kind of street voice or somehow in yeah. that in that different way. The it's interesting you're kind of mentioning that. Convinced. The main challenge for many of the artists who consider themselves still to have street cred, mm. street value, uh, and, and many of them do. Shepard Ferry is a good example of, of, of mm. that individual who's very well known but has produced editions, mm. is that being bought by major collectors or by celebrities takes them into a realm where they lose their roots. So mm. when Banksy put on his show, uh, it, barely legal in the States in 2006, okay. the minute that Jude Law turns up with Angelina Jolie and um, David Beckham, the whole thing is the game's off. He's entered another kind of environment. Right. And I think that causes some of those artists real problems. It probably didn't cause Rubens a problem necessarily, but mm. for a street artist who thinks, you know, oh, I've got to stay... Um, important and offensive and edgy you're going to get all that rubbed off when um you know with, jude law or, or you know brad pitts bought your art possibly but with shepherd ferry who was uh, the connection to the to the obama campaign was yeah. part of his undermining like he he tried to distance himself from obama not long after oh, no, okay. because you know obama is then becomes mm. the becomes the standard right. figure mm. he yeah. uh also, he lost a lot of credit credibility because he lied about where the origin of the of the material was mm -hmm. until one of his his um, gallery, uh, one of his uh, studio staff was going to reveal had had all the data on a hard mm -hmm. disk was going to reveal where the original image came from, and then he had to mm -hmm. he dropped the lawsuit which was going to claim copyright and admitted that he he was lying, mm -hmm. which led to this next sure. uh, the next thing that happened to him. If you if you uh, Google deface the asterisk face, there's quite a bit of work in there. That Josh okay. Owens, yeah. beautiful, interesting, yeah. novel work in all different forms, from a you know uh, a, a plaster bust through to uh, defaced stamps, through right. to uh, greetings cards. It's just extraordinary kind of versatility. And these artists, they, there's no stopping them. They're just prolific and, and imaginative. Go onto the website and you realize that he has set up a commercial operation, has got a gallery that mm. promotes other artists. And that's what mm. interests me about that lineage is that what's interesting about uh, Shepard Ferry, about DeFace, about Banksy is that they recognize they've come from uh, a pool of talent and they're now trying to give that pool of talent an okay. opportunity. So lots of exhibitions, lots, you realize how good as curators they are themselves. Mm. And, and Banksy is very interesting in terms of saying, I literally, I bloody hate art galleries. In fact, it's three organizations here they all start with a uh, art galleries hey, art galleries auction houses make right. a bigger living out of the back of artists and academics i think having learned so, yeah. um, and and that was, i'm not playing that game i'm not playing that game and what's interesting about the boom in the purchasing power of the work in there is that's bought by by 
members of the public who would very rarely go into an art gallery. Right. And that's another yeah. world altogether. I mean, what I find interesting about that is it's is it's not it's not dissimilar to what happens in the world of art, and that's the anti-art stance, mm. which becomes mm. like a performative thing. And you, as much as mm. as much as Banksy will position himself like that, we all know that the, <laughs> yes. his operation relies on all, all his aids. Yeah. Apart from academia, he can do without that. No, um, no, we can't. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> he could do without that. Um, but uh, the. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that exists previously within contemporary art. There's, there's Joseph Boyce who would say that this is my detritus, and yeah. the word you use. Yeah. So this, this is not uh, my art. All of that stuff is now in art in galleries. Mm. He said that the only, the thing that mattered was the was the rela social relationship to his work, which is kind of what mm. graffiti artists mm. try mm. to say. And what doesn't matter is all of this stuff. But it was a position. He was. It's a a performance in a way, you know, and it's mm. and it's a bit like what artists in general, but certainly graffiti artists, I think. Mm. So I'm, only, I'm thinking the bank, the bank that self destroyed itself. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, it's a performance, it's so which, obvious, which, which is yeah, which yeah, is yeah. like I'm destroying the work, yeah, yeah. but it became more valuable because it was destroyed with the one that went to a shredder when it kind of came out. So, so that's the most extraordinary object, and uh, to go from being a 2D print mm. into a 3D form in a frame into a 4D. <laughs> there's not much artwork that's yeah. moved in that kind of way yeah. but that's also there's a there's an element there and i've talked about a lot about this recently about can i call it self-hatred there's something in there where okay. first of all the targets okay we know he uses the auction house in particular kind of he she they mm. but also that is a very sentimental image um, young girl red blue right. vanishing yeah belongs to another era or posted okay. on the wall in, in Brighton, then turn it into numerous prints, numerous greeting cards. Mm. And to turn back on that and say, you know, that was then, this mm. is now. So it, it denies his own past by saying, sentimental, ordinary image, don't want to feel part of it. Mm. And then it goes into the auction house and says, you know what, I really loathe these organizations because they, the artist doesn't gain anything from an auction house, except notoriety, reputation, etc. But in terms of cash, the on sale of a painting not much gets back to the answer at all. Tax, you get a little bit of discount there, but compared to what you yeah. expect from mm. the sale of that in, in right. a commercial gallery, which is a 50% markup. So they're trying to subvert that. And I think mm. one word we haven't used thus far is the notion of subversion, because mm. a lot of what you're seeing here and online takes the, the graphic iconography that you'd expect to see Nike in command mm. of, mm. and then, or any of the kind of advertising agencies, and plays two games. I love the words. One is subvertising, so it turns it back on itself, and the other one is kind of form of brandalism. And brandalism. they're really interesting <laughs> notions. You're taking off taking something that is so well known and then trying to give it, skewer it. But that yeah. brandalism is is direct from the situationist international and that stuff. Yeah, um, and yeah. bringing back to that, the kind of, you know, the situationists and that idea, that situationist is the idea that, you know, that it was against the kind of the capitalist yeah. ideal and the, and, and the kind of idea that you consume art or, or the spectacle of art mm -hmm. and that something had to be, something that had to be activated, mm -hmm. you know, and we kind of see it in, in, in some of the work in there, that especially when you find it in the street, you come upon it and then it activates itself mm. because it's in a situation. And I, and I suppose there is that question, and I think it comes up even in the, the essay with this, of, you know, caging the wild animal. Mm. And so I think you're kind of bringing up and, you know, are they, are they, you know, are they clever? Are they, are they outrunning the auction house and the, and, and the academics That's and things question, like that? Yeah. You know, are they outrunning mm. them? Mm. Or, or is this, you know, is, 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 the, is the hill, is it the mountain that goes up? And then like mm. art movements do, they, they, they crumble and fade. And then it's the time, somebody else takes the baton. So um, Dick Hepburn is here now, the whole cultural historian, we're talking about revolting to style, what has once been as a revolution, radical, disruptive, within a few months' time is absorbed, you know, mm. the idea that you could great. be a punk period wearing a safety pin next minute, Liz Hurley's wearing, you know, one at, uh, you know, cans or whatever. So that revolting to style is very hard to stay ahead. It's, but it's interesting that it kind of faces into what we thought of as a kind of dead topic, the avant-garde, that mm. actually you've got a group of artists here who, both canny commercially, but also always trying to find an edge. And I've always been in any kind of discussion around some of the work in there. I like to think that it does have an edge to it still, even if it's in a frame, do you think it's possible? I wonder, like I'm thinking about like uh, the sort of classical modernist sort of um, mm. criticism of uh, the, the divide between, the, you know, uh, Clement Greenberg, whenever he didn't like anything, he'd say it was illustration. I'm certain, <laughs> I'm certain he would think all of that is illustration. Yeah. He would absolutely, mm. as much as it exists uh, with, uh, you know, it, it, it tricks, trick, it's, a, it's a trickster's mm. art and stuff mm. like that. It's it's a popular art, it's mass art. Anything mm. that was, uh, which had any relationship to what he 
would call uh, advertising or mm. uh, <laughs> you know uh, lots of people would call from that era would, would would see would see the relationship there to that and would just dismiss it mm. as as popular art thus mm. illustration and maybe I, I could uh, maybe I'll say it sounds very <laughs> Frank Francis Bacon once said he was bored by a lot of figurative painting yeah. illustrative painting yeah bored by the um the, the what he called the, the graphic languages, the boredom of its conveyance. Mm. It wasn't done with it kind of immediate. Yeah. So I love that phrase. Yeah. I don't use it very often, but it's a kind of um, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one in terms of yeah, uh, illustration. Uh, yeah. And thinking about that, and you know, why 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 did it happen in its time? Where did this, I mean, is it just purely because people had spray cans and suddenly thought, oh gosh, I can do this on the, I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, as I said, this this 99, right, you know, we've had this now for like, you know, 20, oh. 30 years nearly. What What, what, what is yeah, it that this I time has allowed this? And I think it's social, social media. Mm. There's, a, there's an artist working in Bournemouth at the moment I met mm. who, uh, you know, I think is capable, of, often it takes one change agent to come into a town, a city, region or whatever. And he's he works in an idiom very similar to what you see in front of you here. And Stuart is, uh, told me that at the time when he was actually trying to merchandise, trying to sell his work as an impoverished artist mm. who couldn't complete his degree because of ill health. Mm. Uh, and he used the only social media he had available at the time, which is eBay. Right. And he said he would do three drawings a day and put them on eBay at two pound a pop and they would eventually find their level. And they did. And eventually, incredible story, incredible story. It's just down the centre of Bristol. If you go into Bobby's and go into the gallery there, and this is a, a, a an artist now who set up a studio with many, many, many assistants working on a whole range of fascinating projects. He made a living, and a gallery came to him. Right. So I think that what you see and what you just asked there, Dominic, is that um, with the rise of eBay, with the rise of social media, with transactions being done online, where where the punter did not have to go into a gallery and pay commission. Mm. I think the several things came together quite well. Uh, and again, I was writing about this, that the very moment where an artist could put something in the public domain, 20 foot up a wall, mm. those who were interested in it would flock to it and take a photograph, mm. put it on Instagram. So they'd be the first to get, he'd get it up as it were on the wall. They would get it up on social media. And some of these artists that we're looking at here have got tens of millions of followers, tens yeah. of millions, uh, and most of them follow nobody at all. So there's a very even there. So the social media started broadcasting this material, which was ephemeral, was meant to last a very short time, but suddenly goes viral through social media. So you've got okay. a, I think that's what it's capturing, yeah. actually. So in a way, is it, is this, is it a liberation? Yeah. Is it a liberation because the individual, the artist or the, you know, the illustrator could suddenly takes back the power from the, the publisher, the, um, you know, yeah, the, 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 the gallery. It's, the... it's meant to be affordable. I think it's affordable. Mm. Well, graffiti art in general or? Uh, so and what I find interesting is the eBay thing. I remember that mm. brief period of time before we diversified into uh, the, the different sort of uh, um, marketplaces, sites that dealt with art mm. we had a little weird thing where ebay became a place to buy prints you know mm. and this was people who would call themselves artists or illustrators selling on ebay a very brief period and but then i and then i think about that and then i think about that before we had nfts mm. people were as a joke as a as a way of undermining as a way of sh of showing the the, mm. the 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 absurdity of doing so were selling memes on ebay Okay. And everybody was bidding up to millions of dollars mm -hmm. for them. This is in America. Mm -hmm. And that was before the NFT. So there was, first of all, the idea of buying a meme became a joke on, the, on eBay before it actually became a reality. <laughs> and I, I feel like some of that sort of radical punch of, mm -hmm. of what we're seeing there, and I think mm -hmm. it's great you're identifying with the era and everything like that. I think, like you say, social media has stolen that radical punch. Mm -hmm. When you can have these people making this joke that loads of people can claim they're bidding on something for mm -hmm. millions of dollars, mm -hmm. and it's and it's an image, and it's a viral image, it's an image which is uh, which the authorship is unknown. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's something there which takes away mm -hmm. what that is. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question about <laughs> This is more about transactions yeah. than it does about the art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we are, we're getting into a conversation yeah, nearly about kind of shopping. <laughs> And it's such an interesting place to go yeah. with, with, with what is essentially radical art, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and it's so that's and, and I think on that, you know, that you know, we're talking about Stuart Semple and we talked about a lot of these artists who are kind of you know, they're, they're quite pushy, they're kind of you know, identifying themselves. And you know, and I was, um, you know, I know they're incognito, and I was I've been looking around the exhibition, and, and I suppose. We're sitting here as you know three three white men, but I I do feel you know, what are, you know the diversity of this kind of art because sure. it seems to me it's, it, it's quite a lot. Of, I'm guessing 
but I know there's one uh, def- definitely there's Miss some um, Miss Van Miss yeah. Van, yeah. Van but yeah. it's a very male world mm. and maybe you know I always think of graffiti as being quite a kind of multicultural mm. place yeah. you know and the kind of subways and things like that but this I feel isn't quite mm. such the same way mm. uh, is that fair mm. it, um if so why should that be and then maybe thirdly is it changing I was described the, the, the graffiti street writing mm urban art when it's in the urban dom- domain I always describe it as being like a contact sport mm. I think it's actually quite a tough environment um, and people say to me isn't it outrageous that you know when I did a piece on the um the, the artwork the banks he did in Nottingham you know press would bring up and say first of all is it genuine you have this kind of weird conversation mm. like genuineness and authentic which I always mm. have a kind of range of answers for mm. and then what's it worth that's always the next it goes to a cycle I've done it so many times so is it is it really uh, by him a week in advance, and I, I have a couple of wild guess and usually wrong, and say, well, he still can't draw hands, and that gives me no, no <laughs> can't draw hands by the way. But um, and then the, how much is it worth? And uh, and then it's taken off the wall, so it's kind of vandalised. Uh, but people then get very protective about it. Right. It, so it is generally uh, addressing a diverse audience. I've got dozens of photographs of people who congregate and spend time. Uh, and this, this covers a whole range of you know, people in Nottingham and further afield and people fly from all over. But it is quite gendered, I think. Mm, Although yeah. if Joshua here, when I talked to him about that, he would say, well, let me just show you Miss Van's oh. work or this person or yeah. that. Because often they're hiding behind a, a, a handle. That's what I mean, I, 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 I yeah. Kind of like, yeah. Uh, and I checked out, if you check out Miss Van's work now, it's really impressive what she does and still does on the streets of, of Spain, tests out a lot of the ideas, but then obviously has a commercial arm which is expansive and it isn't just about prints we're talking about t-shirts mugs etc because why not you know they're they're just because they're street artists doesn't mean they can't be clever as well in terms of of, of making a, a living so much of her work is illustration yes you know, it is. it's in that field it it is. Is. like shepherd ferry i would say that's the other person on the mm. show that yeah. you'd see mm. of that mm. world mm. And again, of, of a certain era, we've connected with the early 2000s. It's interesting. I don't see it as a threat to the fine art practice, but I would probably see it as quite a threat to the notion of what is illustration. Now. What, what would you see as the um, the radicalism? The, the, just the kind of visual language, just the way it's presented, the way it incorporates text and image. It doesn't work to editorial yeah. necessarily. So the, what you're saying there is kind of grotesque in some, in mm. some sense. Yeah, so that that is a thing that illustration has always taken ownership of mm. for a long time even mm. before what we call punk and everything and all of that the change there the idea mm. that you would do in order to express something you would you would make a mistake in, in the relationship between text and image and stuff mm. like that mm. that's i mean that's not that new but um it's the thing is is that the idea of illustration it's like you can define it by the industry or by the, the subject and mm. the and the act of illustrating mm. like a photograph is an illustration so it's not something that's really threatened yeah. Whereas the contemporary art market can be threatened mm. by 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 um, street art, street art as a thing that links in with fashion can be threatened. Mm. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I guess what I'm saying. Well, I'm seeming to be arguing <laughs> illustration can't be threatened. It's not a career in illustration, <laughs> don't we? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. the but then the illustration is subject to fashion, like yeah. the industry is subject yeah, to fashion, yeah. just like all of these other disciplines we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I mean, you know, I'm I'm going to, going to pass it over to the audience, I think, soon. But I think you know what I'm thinking of. You know, the iconoclast and when they started, you know, that, that way that it was kind of against some kind of system and it mm. was that anti art, that anti authority against mm. the galleries, against the auction house. I mean, thanks. I've got it written down here. I, I, you know, he sold in March 2021, $23 million, 170, sorry, $23 million one hundred seventy six thousand three hundred fourteen dollars wow. for a Banksy. You know, they 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 are, you know, but and I heard the, you know the future's here when the what is this the 2020s or something they'll have a name soon, won't it, where we are. But mm. but where are the iconoclasts and where is this street art going? Is it going anywhere else? Mm. Is it is it heading off into some other paradigm we haven't quite seen yet? But there's a section I've been writing at the moment about the value, the auction value of a number of the artists and like uh Herring, Keith Herring comes up extraordinary Basque yeah. as well. Yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah. Of, of held their position there. What's interesting about them is we, I thought we'd gone through the, the notion of the kind of myth, the Van Gogh syndrome with the mythological artists who'd moved into a different era, post, I suppose, Duchamp and the, mm-hmm. with, with uh, Factory and everything that Warhol did. We've kind of gone backwards. We've right. thought her- heroicized guess- these obscure artists who are no longer obscure painted in the subway. The, the fascination with, with the world's greatest unknown artist is undiminished. Mm-hmm. So, and, and you know, it must be in his mid 40s, late 40s now, no longer cutting edge, but now. Mm-hmm. Do cutting up pictures, you know. I, mean, uh, <laughs> but, um, I think it's 
not a busted flush by any means, because we're all fascinated by it, fascinated by their journey that many of them mm. have made. And you see what Herring did down the subways. Mm. It was phenomenal draftsman. Yeah, you yeah. see the work. You just think, oh, it's, it's the kind of drawing that Matisse could have done more. And I was at the Paula Rego show the other day and looking at how she draws and thinking that, you know, the quality of line you see in the art, there's some of those artists when you watch them working. Right. Uh, are female and male on the streets in this big, big uh, wild style. Draw, I can draw on that scale. Mm. And yeah. I draw every weekend, I can draw on that scale. I suppose when you're talking about Basquiat and, mm. and Keith Herring, mm. you realise, so from, from my mind, and this might sound like diminishes uh, what we're seeing out there, I do see it as heritage, but I think mm. heritage can be radical and can still exist mm -hmm. in the radical of now. And you look at Keith Herring and, and Basquiat, and that is radical imagery. Mm. It's really exciting mm. imagery. Mm. I mean, if I'm honest, I'm more excited about that than, than quite a lot of the British stuff we yeah. see here. I, I'm interested in, in the relationship with the, mm. with the marketplace and all that. Yeah. But, you know, the... There's nothing uh, wrong with heritage being radical and us and yeah. us like you know deciding what that is and working it out. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. Future, mm. I think I'll go back to. I mean, for me, it's probably online. It's the yeah. the act, the iconic, I mean, the is that, iconic. Is that the new online. street? Is the I mean, you know, is, is, is I mean, I, I don't like a big one. Is yeah. it the new street? Yeah. But um, we haven't been out that much for quite a while. And I'm just wondering <laughs> yeah. if the yeah. online becomes the kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. the new kind of form of something. Mm. I just. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, so, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think on that point, if it's okay, we're going to open up to the floor. I don't know if we can get anything through the online or something. Um, that's but um, if there's anybody here, would any like to ask a question? Anybody? We we would be open to it. Yeah, I'm oh. kind of thinking about the beating and bringing it into the gallery situation. Because you know it, it's urban, it's all rigid, it's all walls. I mean, how, how do you process that translate into the gallery? Because I'm just quite intrigued by that impact of the, the work itself. Beyond. I was um, asked a similar question, and, and uh, I always go back to that quote Banksy talks about is like um, taking street art. Uh, uh, off, off the street and into a gallery is a bit like domesticating a wild animal. But somehow that's the context, that's the domain, that's its habitat. To bring it in denies all of that. And so any uh, discussions I've had on radio and telly, people said, so, you know, they're going to take this piece of walk off the wall, let's say, at, um, in Bristol, at Totterdown or in, in Nottingham. And I say, that's just not right. You know, the, the piece of work was given, given, hard, oh, it's an odd word, isn't it? But it was put in the public domain for public enjoyment unsigned unauthenticated and then a month less later someone comes along and pays 350k for it and it gets taken off and put in some trapped in some museum in, in Saffron Waldron or something where Milton Keynes <laughs> I mean I've spoken to the guy I've had lots of conversations and I it, it is about domesticating something that was meant but again it's on somebody's wall so it's an act of transgression it's an act of vandalism how would you feel if it was your wall and you didn't want that there so yeah to me, it's it's moving into another space now, but having it on a wall in a frame is, is speaking a different language to a different audience. But that's shown the elasticity of the artist involved. Yeah, I mean, I agree. But I think it's, what's really interesting for me is that strangeness of those people chiseling the stuff off <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and all of that. That's the story of the work. And the, the artist knows that's the story of the work. They mm. know that they know it will be in the press of these barriers around it with the guy who owns the shop, like uh, saying it's mine and all that. The galleries have are problematic in, in you know lots of potential ways, but they can be you know fascinating places for inquiry. But what we're talking about here is obviously an uncomfortable thing. If you take something from a wall and you put it in a gallery, it's it's strange, isn't it? Yeah. But the the the, the story is fascinating. The first question they always ask is. Uh, well, first of all, is it by that artist? Then they're saying, what's it worth? What's it worth? What's it worth? And I refuse to give an answer. I always say, and I've got this kind of off pat now. I say, I'll tell you what it's worth. It's worth a member of the public traveling 20, 30 miles into the center of Nottingham. And it's worth them standing in the rain in a queue to get in front of that and get a selfie. And that's what it's worth. I said, it's the best sort of public art, isn't it? That it actually touches tens of thousands, perhaps millions of people. It might be worth 350K, but I'm not going to give you the answer about what it's worth because it has an emotional worth. And, and I have seen people, you know, literally standing in the rain in a queue thinking, but my turn now. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at Reading Jail, uh, but there was a huge queue, British, a great queue in the queue in front of public art in a long line. <laughs> and uh, I used to take photographs of them queuing and then the mm -hmm. picture you can see it in there and talk to quite a few of them. And that is sense of neighbourhood ownership and belonging. 
was, was, was palpable, it was palpable. And uh, you wonder how that has come about, because most other public art wouldn't necessarily touch them in that way. It speaks to the soul, somewhere, the British soul. Dominic, uh, for those who are watching on Zoom, could you ask, could you repeat the question? Mm. Dominic, could you repeat the question? For those sure, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, sorry, but, okay. Um, so if you could ask the question, Dominic's going to say for those who Yeah, I'll say that, yeah. But could I have a, another question? There was... I wanted to ask a question, which is about women making art. And I've seen, you've probably seen it too, but it's where, and it is mostly women, mm. do knitting. Yeah, they okay. knit on things like dancers and all over. And I wonder, is that not the same credibility or lack of credibility? So, so uh, a question there about, you know, the, 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 we, 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 we're women artists who kind of use knitting as a, as a, as a, as a form of... Well, they're changing... Urban landscape. Okay, changing yeah. only urban uh, urban landscape through knitting, and so actually Pauline Stanley, who was a student here, is yes, she's doing a lot of work, yeah. you know, with, the, with this knitting and, and knitted landscapes. Sure. I'm just thinking, does that have credibility, or is it's that somehow on, it's, it's called on the street called nititi, as in K N I T I T I, that's a graffiti. Yeah. Um, I think that what interests me, and I've I've kind of done a lot of work on this, is all forms of public intervention, mm. uh, and. It, I sometimes think it's to do with the nature of democracy, where people feel that the vote isn't really making a difference, uh, and and you get these interventions done. I I, I took a photograph so it, once of, yeah. of of, a, of a during the height of the Gulf War, um, outside a, a war memorial in the centre of a city. Curious place to do it, but war memorials are often seen as places you can project all sorts of both reverence and anxieties onto. Mm -hmm. And in front of it, there was a, a small cardboard coffin about the size of a child, covered in flowers, and someone had written on it. Uh, the price of oil. And I've so, so there's interventions where people feel their voice has not been heard in the ballot box and make as many effort, both both political, they might be decorative as well. So the the, the knitting is a way of kind of adorning the landscape. Yeah. Uh, I just think that there's yeah. kind of a, so, an outpouring of people who want to make a public intervention. I mean, can I, can, in a way, can, can we say that, you know, that, that, that what we're talking about is actually a kind of form of folk art. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's it's oh, where yeah. the folk art's headed yeah. that used to be, yeah. you know, is the voice of the people. Yeah. You know, it's coming up from there rather than sure. down from there. It's also got a craft element. People want to feel that their their process is recognised. That actually, it's it's really knitting and crocheting and the like has value, yeah. and they'd like to be able to get it. There probably aren't enough fora or galleries or craft shops or whatever to present that material. Yeah. It, it bears a, re um, a relationship to craftivism, you know, the craftivist mm. thing. So there was a, you know, the first uh, women's march against Trump, there was a lot of women with the with the knitted uh, uh, craftivist mm. hats and everything. Mm. And I found out about this. I met uh, uh, an American academic in Australia and uh, I was just talking about how the majority of my students and the majority of, of people entering the marketplace as illustrators are women. And we're talking at length and then she was like, you should have this hat. <laughs> she, she gave me the hat and she, she told me the story she said she went on the march I said oh you can't give me this she, yeah yeah you can have it and I've got it in my drawer I don't wear it so it's your folk art collection yeah. Yeah. I will I will have worn it and I won't wear it okay I'll, I'll wear it more. <laughs> but you know and, and then there's you think about the VNA they exhibited some of that stuff in the what was it called the oh I should should have done my research but the uh the the disobedient objects oh, exhibition right. they they yeah. they um mm. they showed some of the that mm. stuff they showed the situation as international stuff right. as well as examples of mm. street art so mm. well things from yeah. that the world of street art it's interesting during the um the green and common protests of the seven, late 70s and 80s mm. a great many of the women uh, adorned the fence with yeah. knitted uh, mm. and mm. and then they watched as the police constables had to get scissors <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. dismantle it yeah. so the whole it was a kind of process nice. of both yeah. adorning and then watching it being taken back, taken down, but it's painstaking to unravel. So, yeah, interesting. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions from the floor? You've talked about um, money a lot. Um, is that why you think the general public, I mean, everybody knows about Banksy, but I've never heard any other people you talk about. Is it really all about the tabloid headlines and the prices it makes? Um, so that was a question about whether, you know, um, hearing about these, these these artists like Banksy or the kind of tabloid headlines actually is is what makes them, is that it, the, the kind of gives them the fame yeah. and therefore it, it actually kind of gives them the kind of commercial success. So, yes, you're right. Money always fascinates. The art market is on fire, has been for some time. I did a, a piece of work for the BBC a couple of weeks ago where they rang up and said, oh, you know, uh, Love is in the Bin is back on the market again. Its reserve is three to four million. 
And I said, on, I did three uh, sessions for radio, or BBC breakfast programmes, and I said the same thing to each of them. It'll be treble that. And they went, no, are you serious? What, 12? And I said, could be 16. And guess what? Yeah. You know, so the market's on fire and people are always attracted to that. Uh, unless it's a watercolour by Prince Charles and they're attracted to it because of the royal story. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's royalty or it's to do with notoriety or it's to do with money. I'll tell you yeah. what, the other one is that gets people going now is, is that whole thing about authenticity and copyright. Right. So... Uh, and I, I really feel for the artists here. So say you do one of your wonderful illustrations and the next minute you see on a greetings card sold online and you think, oh, that's, that was mine. And now it's, you know, it's £5.99 saying happy birthday in the middle of it. A lot of street artists have found themselves in a position where their work has been reproduced. And in the last two years, it has become quite an issue. Right. Taken to, uh, to court by artists who are saying, Okay, it was in the public domain, but you just can't take my image. And this has been a really tense kind of conversation. Um, Banksy lost the case in Milan yeah. uh, against a museum. And the museum was actually producing everything from um, mouse mats, mugs, um, street of magnets and the like. It's saying, you can't do this. Artists have some sort of yeah. ownership of that imagery. And they said, sorry. The argument played against him to answer the question was that he and his organisation, I always would he very carefully, he, she or they, had not been actively uh, merchandising, propagating that through the commercial arm. Right. So, you know, suddenly double whammy here. Oh, so I've not been selling the stuff deliberately, therefore you can take my image from me. So what happened was two years ago in Croydon, of all places, up popped a pop-up shop called uh, Gross Domestic Product, mm -hmm. and there everything was for sale based on trademarks. And um, that was the attempt to say, but look, I'm trading. It backfired again. So in the, at the end, the, the law is an ass, uh, to paraphrase you know, many, many years ago. But the artists all seem to be on the losing side in these issues. And, yeah. and he, these are good examples, a bit like the Shepherd Ferry story. You know, it's, it's but he, he should have been on the losing side. I mean, for me, for Shepard Ferry, he'd take the artist. Oh, maybe that the case, yeah. No, yeah. I'm really, I'm, I'm not on his side. No, <laughs> even, though, even though he's an illustrator, <laughs> and I'm an advocate for illustrators. He, he took a yeah. photograph and, re, and reproduced right. it. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like you have a photograph of, of Banksy's work mm. from on a wall as well. And I'm not sure if I would, as much as I'm the defender of the image, I think that I'm really keen on the public space being public. And if you put something in a, in a public space, mm. I, I don't know if I want a, a legal attribute to be placed upon the, the use of it, you know? So, but uh, the, the money thing is, is fascinating. And I love it that you predicted mm. how much it would go for. Mm -hmm. You don't, you, you get bored of the people asking you how much do you think it will be? If you keep predicting it, that's <laughs> what, <laughs> that'll keep coming. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was on record at one o'clock on the Monday, the 9th of August, yeah. of saying the banks had been on a spraycation. Yes. And later on, I suddenly uh, found out it was everywhere, but it's not an easy one to get wrong, is it? You know? Well, yeah, there we go. And I think on that note, I think we're going to say thank you very much to um, Paul Goff and Vincent Lawrence.